sausage. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Big one. Huge. Florida is a water state. It's bordered by more ocean than any other state except Alaska. The warm waters of the Gulf Stream system flow through the Gulf of Mexico around Florida and north towards Newfoundland. The ebb and flow of the Gulf Stream, combined with Florida's ever-changing weather, bathes Florida's coast in warm waters teeming with animal and plant life. It's no wonder that Florida waters are home to some of the planet's most iconic megafauna. Manatees, saltwater crocodiles, goliath grouper, and of course, small-toothed sawfish. These very different species have many things in common, but top of the list is that they are all in trouble, human-made trouble. A hundred years of human assault on the ecosystem have taken a toll on wildlife. Sport fishing, commercial fishing bycatch, and coastal development leading to habitat loss are some of the broader issues. But some of the lesser known impacts unique to sawfish include marine debris entanglement, fin and rostrum trade, and liver oil products. All of these have led to an extinction of the large tooth sawfish in the United States and an estimated 80% shrinkage of the small tooth sawfish range. Um, we took all of those records, all those photographs. Um, we made these maps when we started the research back in 2000. Fortunately for sawfish, they began receiving protection in 1992 when the state of Florida instituted a protection from harvest order, and a gillnet ban was instituted in 1995. Then, in 2003, thanks to Sonia Fordham, a founding member of the sawfish recovery team whose work has focused on publicizing the plight of elasmobranchs and advocating science-based policies on their behalf, NOAA Fisheries listed the entire remaining population of small-toothed sawfish as endangered under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Since the time of listing, NOAA Fisheries is responsible for recovering the species. And in doing so, we need to conduct a, a variety of research to learn about the ecology and the biology of the species. Then we can use that information as baseline information into making management decisions and trying to rebuild the populations to more historical levels. Based on objectives identified in the Small Tooth Sawfish Recovery Plan, teams of scientists now sample and monitor specific areas in South Florida's coastal waters, hoping to understand more about the sawfish population status. One of the main tools used to study the distribution and migration patterns of these animals are internal acoustic tags that are inserted into the abdominal cavity and transmit data to an array of underwater receivers. Two to four times per year, these receivers are recovered from the ocean and the downloaded data paint a picture of who's been in the area. What I have here is one of our VR2 receivers that I am downloading to see if we have heard from any of our acoustically tagged sawfish. And we can do this by Bluetooth. So downloading data, I can see that we have actually heard from quite a few of our sawfish. We actually have 52,000 detections. Um, and this is really important for us to determine habitat use and movement ecology of the juveniles as they move through ontogeny. Andrea's team is part of two large collaborative networks, the ITAG network and the FACT network. Both represent a group of researchers who are tagging animals, from small snappers to large sawfish and lots in between, in the Gulf of Mexico and along the U.S. eastern Atlantic coast. All the receivers speak the same language and can pick up each group's acoustic tags. Data are shared back to the original tag holder, for scientific analysis and addition into the appropriate database. These receivers are one of the most crucial components in the study of sawfish distribution. I got the rostrum. So we completed all our um, biological samples of this animal. We've done all the morphometric information we need. Um, the animal now has a five-year acoustic tag surgically implanted. 
um, and we're ready for the release. So, Andrea. All right, on the count of three, we're gonna send him off into the mangroves. Okay, one, two, three. Collaboration and cooperation between personnel, universities, and agencies are key components of this project. The first pick was of the dart attack? Yep. Quit being so squirmy, dude. Uh -huh. Two other types of tags are used. External fin tags allow for identification by individuals encountering the sawfish after release, while pit tags, similar in nature to microchipping your cat or dog, allow researchers to identify individuals long-term if recaptured. There are three main methods currently in use by the sawfish recovery team to catch sawfish. The first is drumline fishing, to sample larger animals or in a tight space such as a smaller river. We got our five drums out at the 10 cent bridge here in the lower St. Lucie River. Um, we've had some good luck here. We've had some reports from guides here. So we'll, uh, we'll start our morning. We're trying to catch the, the high tide uh, switching, uh, get a slack tide, sometimes that helps. The second sampling method is long line fishing to sample a larger area, such as bays and estuaries. A lot of the records that we have uh, of adult small tooth sawfish either come from recreational fishers that catch them or from the commercial long line fishery, the, the directed shark fishery. And so we started a long line survey in 2011 um, that basically we use the same gear as the, the, the commercial shark fishermen use. To catch, uh, to catch sawfish. And, uh, and so we've been sampling down in the Florida Keys um, and uh, Florida Bay and other parts of, of Everglades National Park um, since that year, since, since 2011. Since the beginning of this project, Dean and his team have sampled more than 100 large adult sawfish using this method. More than half of those animals are wearing a 10-year acoustic tag and transmitting data. A few of these animals have been detected all the way up to the Florida Panhandle and Charleston, South Carolina. The center of the distribution of the, of the adults is down here in Southwest Florida, in Florida Keys and Everglades National Park, but as the population uh, is recovering, we expect to see more and more large animals moving up the coast, and so we're also doing work in the Tampa Bay region, hoping to catch and tag some of those animals that are using those more northern habitats. Yeah, yeah we've got plenty of room okay. to put. Tanya Wiley is Tampa Bay's sawfish resident scientist and advocate. Her mission is to promote protection of imperiled marine species through research, outreach, and education. I'm doing research on sawfish. Uh, I am up here in Tampa Bay, the very northern extent of their range. We get about a dozen reports a year in the Tampa Bay area. Um, I've only caught two in the Tampa Bay area in six years. Tampa Bay is at the extreme northern end of the current sawfish range, and continued year-round monitoring is crucial to determine if the range is expanding. Well, we just did our first sets of the winter, hence the reason we're all bundled up. Um, we're in the area of Tampa Bay where we've detected several of juvenile sawfish that were tagged down in the Charlotte Harbor area. But we're continuing to get more reports here and we're detecting more sawfish here that have been tagged elsewhere. Uh, so that's why we just started, started the directed project here. The third method used is to deploy a fine mesh net in the shallows where juveniles and young of the year typically hang out. Tag one. Air tag. Well, we just caught several juvenile sawfish. We got a couple in each bin. One of them's a new fish, and you can see here, this fish here is a recap. It's one of our fish we tagged just about a month ago or so. A couple of these sawfish are actually tagged by our collaborators who work for NOAA, who were here a couple months ago. So we can see how much they've grown since then. Once they are disentangled from the gill net, then they are placed in a holding net to await the scientific workup and tagging process before being released. 
So we're here uh, near Chukaluski, Florida. This is on the west coast. Uh, this is an area that our collaborators work pretty regularly. Um, they saw a bunch here a couple of weeks ago, tagged a few. Uh, we came down to try and tag a few more. Uh, and this area is really neat because one of the fish that came from this area was recaptured over on the east coast a couple of weeks ago when we were over there. So there's some connectivity uh, between the west coast of Florida and the east coast of Florida. So it'll be really neat to see, you know, this this group of, um, you know, maybe 15 or 20 that we're tagging this year, uh, see where they go. So uh, really, really uh, awesome opportunities. The sawfish that Greg spoke of was an adult female that had been tagged years before in Chakolowski. She was recaptured, caught actually by an angler with rod and reel in the St. Lucie Inlet, and the captain had the forethought to call the sawfish hotline and report the catch. Greg's research team happened to be in the area and was able to confirm the connection between the two locations. So Dylan, Andrew, and I help maintain the U.S. Sawfish Hotline. And at FWC, we take phone calls, emails, and submissions through the, the website about people that have seen or caught sawfish around the country. People that call in and report their sightings or capture to us help us determine where we can go uh, sample and respond to these reports. So. It's not necessarily that this species is making the recovery that we need to see, but um, the word gets out more and our hotline is out there and more people are responding to it. And those reports help direct where we go and sample ourselves and do our research. So those reports are a big reason why we came to the St. Lucie River this week to tag some of these sawfish that have been reported to our hotline. It is illegal to target sawfish while fishing. They are a protected species and have been since 1992. But occasionally, while fishing for other species, incidental catches do occur. The anglers or net fishermen's best course of action is to be respectful. Never remove the animal from the water or drag it ashore. Remember that this is a protected species and it deserves the best welfare that you can give it. Release the sawfish unharmed by cutting the line close to the mouth or carefully untangling the rostrum from the net. Report your sawfish encounter to the sawfish hotline. These three simple things will go a long way in helping the sawfish to survive and populations to increase. These citizen scientist reports to the hotline add important information to the sawfish database that help the sawfish recovery team understand trends and set future goals for the species. While the population trends are showing signs of increasing and scientists are cautiously optimistic that the small tooth sawfish are recovering, sawfish still face two formidable and ongoing threats, commercial fishing bycatch and habitat loss to commercial land development. Scientists' best estimates are that the sawfish population is not likely to fully recover for at least four or five more decades. Short-term goals are to continue outreach programs, to educate the general public, and to continue with scientific survey and sampling projects to monitor populations. The ultimate goal is to recover the population to the point where it no longer needs the protection of the Endangered Species Act.